an old friend of mine, Laura Phillips. Um, Laura is a senior lecturer in the history department at Northwest, um, where she's just started a new job. And she studies and writes on the rural history and political economy of late apartheid South Africa. She's published in the Journal of African History and the Journal of Southern African Studies, amongst others. And she completed her, her PhD at NYU and a master's degree in African Studies at Oxford. Um, this paper is part of Laura's exciting book project, exploring new processes of accumulation and class formation in South Africa from the 70s to the start of the 21st century. And I'm going to introduce our discussant as well um, at the beginning so that we can just move straight into the discussion after Laura's paper. So our discussant today is Tim Gibbs, who's a lecturer in African history at UCL. His first book, Mandela's Kinsmen, Nationalist Elites and Apartheid's First Bantustan, came out in 2014, and it looked at ethnic identities and elite nationalism in an era of mass insurrection and insurgency in South Africa. And he's currently working on professional and elite formation in a segregated society, legal activism and land rights debates, and human rights debates in the Cold War period. So the structure of this um, seminar will be, Laura will have 30 minutes um, to present her paper, followed by a 10-minute discussion from Tim. We'll then open up the floor for questions for the remaining part of the seminar. Laura's paper today is entitled Pensions and Platinum in the Provinces, Accumulation and the Making of a Black Capitalist Class in Limpopo. So thanks, Laura. Over to you. Great, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen, um, and I'm keeping an eye on time. But do if I if I do look like I'm going to go over, please just interrupt. Um, I assume and hope that you can see that, but let me know if not at any point. Um, just a second. Okay. So that should be taking up the full screen. Thanks. So thanks very much, uh, everybody. Thank you very much to the UFS History Department um, for the invitation to present today. It's very nice. I was complaining just before we started about uh, lots of marking, but it is really very nice to be encouraged and given the space to get back to uh, my own research um, and think through some of the ideas that I was playing with uh, during my PhD. And as Rebecca said, I'm now moving towards uh, create a uh, developing into, into a manuscript. Um, and so I'm really using this presentation to put forward some kind of new ideas that I'm uh, trying to think through as I as I mer as I I turn my PhD into, the, into this manuscript. So um, any comments and suggestions, what you think works and what you think doesn't work would be really hugely appreciated. Um, and thanks all for, for being here. Um, and to Tim, who's taken the time out to look at the draft of the paper and, and give comments. Um, so I should just say, I just want to say one, one thing about the time period. So uh, it is very recent uh, history that this paper uh, is covering, but um, I am trained as a historian and so I hope that uh, you will uh, kind of keep an historian's eye on the methods that historians use when uh, listening to my presentation um, and it's really those methods that I've used despite the fact that it's very much a contemporary history that I'm, that I'm telling, telling here. Okay, so before I kind of get into the details of the of the particular presentation, I just want to set the scene a little bit. Um, so uh, though the presentation focuses on the Limpopo province, which uh, was called the Northern Province up until the early 2000s, from 94 up until the early 2000s, uh, the broader project that uh, this chapter uh, fits into is one that is looking at the history of class formation um, and accumulation in an area and a territory that uh, formed the old Bantustan of Leboa, the northern Sutu Bantustan. It's, I've got it up here on the screen. I'm sure actually most of you, you know this already, but um, up on the screen is where Leboa is uh, in relation to the other Bantustans, that light green color. It's Leboa, along with Gazankulu and Venda, uh, was incorporated into uh, what became Limpopo province in 1994. And I'm not going to spend much any time really talking about the history of, of Leboa, but I do want to just flag it now because I'll make reference at various points throughout the, throughout the presentation to uh, the Leboa past of some of the actors um, that, I'm, that I'm speaking about. Okay. 
so uh, that that is kind of the the geographical context uh, to to the presentation today. Um, but what I really want to kind of put forward as my as my main argument, and then I'll flesh it out with some uh, some details uh, in the presentation. The main argument that I want to put forward today is that one can explore, one can use an exploration of the state and business, and the state uh, with the caveats that it is multiple and layered and varied. But nonetheless, you can explore a relationship between the state and business to examine the ways in which new forms of accumulation, um, new patterns of uh, accumulation developed in, uh, in the example that I'm using today in, in Limpopo. And in particular, what I want to argue is that by exploring this relationship between the state and business, you can see a very particular kind of accumulation, a pattern of accumulation developing um, in, in the context that I'm speaking about today. And that uh, pattern of accumulation could be characterized, could be described as one in which um, accumulation happens through the integration into vertical networks, networks which kind of move, move upwards. And just to lay it out um, as clearly as I can, uh, this is the argument, this is gonna be an exploration of the relationship between state and business and the form of accumulation that is um, evident through this is through, these, through this integration into vertical networks. Um, and so what does this mean? And what is the significance of this? So vertical networks um, kind of uh, relation are often used to describe relations between patrons and clients um, in kind of a classic neo-patrimonial model of what society looks like and how society stratifies. Um, it com contrasts to other forms of stratification in society, which perhaps look a bit more like um, classic class formation, uh, happen on a more kind of horizontal scale. Um, and in, the, in this kind of vertical um, uh, a form of accumulation and these vertical kind of hierarchies, uh, this is something that is a pattern that is often uh, emphasized um, and drawn out in scholarship on the nature of um, post-colonial post -colonial Africa. So in, to some degree, this is what I mean when I say that uh, the accumulation that we're seeing is accumulation through these kind of vertical, vertical networks. However, Despite the fact that this is what this accumulation looks like, this is how people uh, accumulate resources and material wealth, I don't want to make the argument that this is simply uh, a case of, um, of, of neo-patrimonialism or clientelism in the classic sense as it's described in the literature. Though though it looks similar, you can't. My argument is that you can't just look at the form. You can't just look at the way in which accumulate accumulation presents. But rather, it's important to look at how that form is facilitated. What the strategies are, such that this vertical integration is uh, is the form of accumulation that we're looking at. What are the um, underpinnings of of this uh, vertical integration and, and accumulation? And what you'll see and what I want to demonstrate here is that we, in reality, have a far more complex mechanism than simple patrimonialism or clientelism that is driving stratification and accumulation in post-apartheid uh, Limpopo society. And the way I uh, kind of want to demonstrate this to you is through through two case studies, through two examples. Um, and I could very easily, and perhaps it would have been more accurate to call this presentation tenders and platinum, but of course there's an appeal to um, an alliteration. But the particular tender that I want to look at is the tender for, for pensions, for the rollout of pensions. Um, and then the second case study that I, that I want to look at is, uh, is platinum. So let me begin now by kind of laying out the argument for why it is uh, that tenders, and in one particular case of uh, the tenders for, 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 for pensions, demonstrates to us, well, allows us to explore the relationship between state and business, and in doing so, see a strategy of, um, or, or kind of a, a pattern of accumulation that uh, demonstrates vertical integration. So before I kind of get into the details of that particular story, let me first just emphasize why it is that tenders are such a significant part of uh, Limpopo's um, economy and economic activity. And the story uh, 
can be told in, in, in many different ways, but kind of at its core is the reality that Limpopo has a very weak economy. It, uh, though there was great hope and excitement about its potential in the post-apartheid period, it has really struggled as a province to um, overcome its historical baggage. And it is uh, there's significant poverty and very little private sector economic activity in the province. Instead, what that means is that uh, local government, provincial government is uh, perhaps, I think it's the it is the largest spender, the largest buyer at a provincial level. Um, and what you have here is um, a graph. Uh, the, the orange line at top is provincial spending. Um, and the blue line, which is about a third, is uh, procurement. So uh, the state, the provincial state, is procuring significant amounts, um, and this kind of crowds out much other private sector activity that is happening in the province. And so it is through tendering that um, that we have some of the most dynamic um, and uh, forms of economic activity in, in Limpopo. Okay, so then the question is, what is the relationship between, between those who are granting the tenders um, who fall within, on, who sit on the tender board, who kind of are parts of the Limpopo state, and those who are applying for and and and, and winning the tenders. To put it into the, the the phrasing that I used before, what is the relationship in this instance between the state and business? And, and in this particular instance, the relationship can be characterized as an incredibly intertwined one. Um, there is not significant distinction between those who are in the state and those who are who are in business. Many of them come from the same background um, and they're deeply interwoven um, networks of people. And this can be explained uh, by a brief kind of uh, historical reference. And that is quite simply that the ANC historically has been a very broad church. And though scholarship increasingly recognizes this still in some of the classic writing on the ANC, the ANC's multiple constituencies, uh, often with con uh, almost contradictory kind of ideologies, are often overlooked. In reality, however, the ANC incorporated uh, and brought together wide ranges of different groups of people. In the old Lebo Bantustan, um, it included, and a very kind of prominent group within, within of the ANC within the Lebo Bantustan were Lebo businessmen, and it really was, it was men most of the time, not 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 women. Um, and those businessmen who affiliated with the ANC but nonetheless made their wealth within the Bundestag primarily fell under the organizational structure of um, what was called the National African Federated Chamber of, of Commerce, um, NAFCOC. So uh, there is huge integration and link between uh, NAFCOC and the ANC pre-94, but even more so post-1994. Um, ANC at a provincial level, it relies very heavily on its NAFCOC supporters and NAFCOC members um, for uh, financial, for uh, support, for business advice and economic um, developments. NAFCOC itself, though it hadn't ever been um, particularly good at uh, a kind of developing a grassroots base, this becomes even more uh, the case post-94 where NAFCOC leadership sees its particular I, I guess value add to its members is uh, kind of give, linking them upwards to uh, the a to to leaders in society, which is often means the ANC and their political networks. So NAPCOC is really thinking that what it can do is connect small business people upwards, and it is the ladder. It sees itself as as the ladder for that. So this then is the relationship between, in this instance, business and the state. And I want to now kind of uh, just outline for you a particular example where we can see how then accumulation happened uh, because of the uh, through these through vertical integration because of because of this relationship. And this uh, the example that I as I indicated that I want to use is the granting of a pension uh, a pension rollout tender in the in the mid 1990s. The story that uh, needs to start a little bit earlier, um, with the ANC first creating in uh, pre-94. Okay, uh, with the ANC creating in the early 1990s an investment arm or an investment vehicle called Tebe. Uh, there's quite a lot of writing on this, so I won't go into uh, explaining this, but the ANC as an organization feels it needs to ensure a steady flow of 
of cash. It creates TEBA, and then TEBA encourages the creation of a provincial level investment vehicles um, where its supporters are able then to channel money into, into the organization. Soon after uh, democracy in 1995, in, in Limpopo, though it was then called the Northern Province, uh, the provincial uh, uh, investment company of Tebe is created. It is called uh, the, Nash, the, the Northern Investment Corporate Holdings, or, or NICO for short. And many of those who are involved with the establishment of NICO are themselves former Bantustan business people who made their both their name and their wealth in the pre-1994 uh, period. Um, the, a year later, 1996, the tender goes out for rolling out pensions across the provinces. Um, this is a major tender, as you can imagine. This fits into to the ANC's broader RDP vision about uh, providing pensions for pensions and grants for uh, the rural, well, for the poor across the country, but particularly the rural poor. And a company that many of you, uh, many of you will recognise the name of this company, Cash Paymaster Services, with Serge Bellamont, wins the tender. But it, Cash Paymaster Services is aware that they that the tender is being granted at a provincial level, not at a national level. And so they create a provincial subsidiary of their national company. It's also called Cash Paymaster Services, but it's Cash Paymaster Services Northern Province. And they uh, apply for the tender and, and win this tender. Now, I put together this little image, and I hope that it doesn't confuse, that it's supposed to kind of explain what is a complicated uh, a set of uh, financial relationships. I hope it does it does that and not confuse. Um, but it turns out there is a bit of an investigation into what happens with cash paymaster services winning of the tender. And it turns out, in fact, that Nico uh, owns 30% of cash paymaster services in Northern Province. There's a series of corruption scandals and court cases, and uh, in this post-94 period, document, documentary evidence is very thin, except in times of huge scandal and where, where uh, fights are played out in the courts. And so there's some very rich uh, documentary uh, uh, material that, that I've been able to draw on uh, to put together this story. Um, but the, in the scandal, it, this becomes clear. I don't really want to get into the corruption part of the story, but I do want to just kind of draw out some conclusions about the, the, the structure of this uh, tender and, and how it was won. So the first thing to point out is, of course, what I think is, is pretty clear, is that Nico was brought on board for the tender, uh, for CPS's tender, because of their political clout. There are a range, I, I've listed here a range of the, the people who are involved, all of whom, as I said, made their name and their and their um and their money pre-94 in, in Le Boer through their links to Le Boer. So um, they, uh, they're brought on, CPS thinks that this will help support their um, uh, uh, application for, for the tender. But I also want to point out something slightly, um, no, well, something very noteworthy, in fact, about the nature of this, of this. So this is, in some ways, one might Think of this as kind of a classic form of BEE tendering. But in reality, this is actually quite different to the way in which BEE is thought of at, as working, um, particularly in the uh, early post-apartheid period, because the black shareholders of NICO are not debt financed. And debt financing is the major way in which BEE is working, working in this period. In fact, they're particularly uh, valuable to CPS not only because of their political clout, but because they have their own wealth to bring into um, bring bring to the table. That wealth having been made um, in in the form of Bantustans. But nonetheless, what we see here is um, uh, a bunch of Bantustan era uh, business people, all who are brought together through um, uh, NAFCOC. Um, Offering and linking upwards to CPS uh, Northern Province to win to win this tender, and there then is this, this example of this kind of uh, accumulation uh, working through the integration of these vertical um, networks networks up, upwards. So that's the one example I want to use to kind of tease out this uh, this argument that I'm making. And the next example I want to use is the example of platinum. And why it's particularly interesting to contrast these two examples is because the relationship between the state and business in these two different instances is very different. 
But nonetheless, as I will show, the outcome in terms of the way in which accumulation is driven is very similar. Okay, so to move on to the platinum story. So there has been a, a significant, very um, uh, illuminating scholarship on the history and the dynamics of the platinum industry in South Africa. Um, and to the degree that some of the scholars writing about this have spoken about the relationship between the state and platinum companies or, or business, um, the way that this is being characterized is as a relationship that is tense but functional. And mostly uh, scholarship has focused on uh, the passing of, in, two, in the early 2000s, the MPRDA, the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act, which nationalized, mineral, um, nationalized minerals in South Africa, which at first really frightened major um, uh, companies. So they were very worried that this would mean that they wouldn't be able to, uh, acute, they wouldn't be able to profit, profit, they wouldn't be able to hold on to their mineral rights. But in reality, what this really did was just um, deracialize capitalist accumulation through the platinum industry um, during, during, through uh, this MPRDA, through, through the legislation. It did put pressure on mining companies to transform their practices, um, but it really uh, didn't put up new obstacles uh, beyond that to the mining companies being able to mine and, and then succeed and, and profit through, through that mining. Um, there was a process in which um, the, the platinum industry did deracialize, and particularly, and uh, scholars like Aninka Klaassens have made this argument very forcefully, um, that one should see the passing of the MPRDA in the early 2000s happening in concert with the ANC um, empowering, driving a legislative agenda to empower the chieftaincy, such that, um, amongst other things, the chieftaincy could act as a BEE um, partner and uh, authority over the land, over mineralized land, uh, which was used and necessary to access for, uh, for the platinum companies. So I want to say all of this is absolutely true. This is a very useful way to think about the relationship between business, between the state, um, and the way in which a black capitalist class was fostered um, in South Africa through, through platinum. But I want to add an extra layer to the story um, and say that in addition to thinking about um, the relationship between business and, uh, and the state as one in which the state is putting pressure on, on mining companies to deracialize, we can also think of the state, and you can really own, you can see this most starkly by looking at the case of Limpopo. We can also think of the state as acting to adjudicate competition between the major mining monopolies, and particular platinum mining monopolies in South Africa, and using this adjudication as a way to drive their, tra their racial transformation agenda. And therefore, because uh, they are uh, adjudicating and not ridding the platinum industry of these major players. Uh, accumulation then is being encouraged through vertical integration into these major players. Um, and, I'll, and I'll explain to you who, who they are in, in a minute. Okay, um, again, I need to backtrack a little bit to make this story uh, legible. Um, and so, uh, well, we, everybody knows that gold underpinned the South African economy for uh, much of the 20th century. But um, from about the 1960s onwards, platinum became increasingly valuable um, on the global market. And it turned out, um, for better or for worse, South Africa has over 80% of, of the world's platinum deposits. And concerted platinum mining started happening in the 1960s in the in what was then Poputitswana on the western limb, which you should be able to see on your screen here. Um, and and the, the limbs refer to what is uh, the Bushveld igneous complex. It's kind of this complex with the deposits of, of platinum. So this um, was primarily, this, this mining was driven by um, a very powerful mining company called Impala Platinum. Not completely, but Impala really um, held many of the mineral deposits, um, held, held leases and, and, and ran mining companies on many of the mineral deposits on the Western Limb in the form of Putitswana. The predecessor to what is uh, today Anglo Platts um, managed, while Impala managed to get much of the Western Limb, 
the predecessor to Angloplatz, I'm just going to call it Angloplatz or Amplatz uh, in this presentation, managed to stitch up the mining rights and the mineral rights or platinum on the northern limb. Uh, you can, sorry, I can see it's actually been cut off at the top, but that's Pipi Rust and uh, the old Port Chilis Rust and the eastern limb um, around Sekakuni land in, in Limpopo. But Anglo, um, the way in which they secured these rights uh, was um, very clearly, and they were, it was kind of an open secret, uh, through not very kosher deals with the old Liberal government. Um, but their strategy was to hold on to these rights, which they secured in, almost in perpetuity, not to operationalize them, not to start mining. And this was a strategy that they used uh, to try and kind of control market conditions. And they didn't want to mine until they were until they were ready to. But because they held on to the rights, nobody else could 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 mine. Post ninety four, there's huge pressure on Anglo from the Department of Minerals uh, and and Energy to let go of some of these rights, open up some of these rights to particularly new black entrants into into the sector. Um, so a series of negotiations starts in the post-94 period. Um, and again, these negotiations are, are quite tense, but the state and the department is also very worried at the same time not to put too much pressure on Anglo, because in particular what they worried is that this will scare investors away. Anglo could say, uh, despite the fact that there were question marks over there, how it was that they managed to get control over these minerals, Anglo could nonetheless say that they had uh, a watertight legal case which gave them control over these minerals and if the department took them away, this would indicate perhaps to a broader investment community that South Africa was not a secure place to do investment, that your tenure wouldn't, wasn't secure under, in South Africa. And so there was a bit of a dance kind of going on between Anglo and the department as the department was trying to wrest uh, these mineral rights away from Anglo. Ultimately, uh, the department was successful and forced Anglo to forego uh, it had 24, it had rights over 24 farms. It, it forced the department to forego, uh, sorry, it forced Anglo to forego about half of those, about 12 of those. And those ostensibly were then going to be opened up to a broader um, community and allow for black economic empowerment um, and allow new entrants into the, into, um, into the sector. However, I want to argue that in reality, though the mineral rights opened up, this, this was done in a very particular way. And uh, the way that this was done, or the way that we can kind of get a lens into how this was done, is again by looking um, at, a, at a court case and a very contentious um, fight over a series of mineral rights um, in, uh, in the former Lebor that Anglo um, had, had control over. Um, and this starts with the creation of a small little mining company called Mampudi Mining on a farm called Drikop. Um, so it's not, it's not uh, clear where it's, it's uh, on the eastern limb. And a farm called Drikop in the former Leboa. And Mampudi Mining is made up, the directors, some of them come, are residents of the farm, long-standing Le former Leboa residents or citizens in the language of the time, um, plus a few geologists and a couple of lawyers. Mampudi makes a play. They say, we want to, uh, we're a black, majority black owned company. We want to enter the sector. They make a play for the mineral rights over Drikop. And uh, the Department of Minerals and Energy turns down their application. At the same time, however, a private deal is going on uh, behind the black, behind the back of the black directors of Mampudi um, with a few of the white directors of Mampudi and Anglo. They manage to secure the rights from Anglo, the small little group, and then sells them over to Impala, which, as you'll, uh, which, which controlled much of the Western limb and is, had rights over much of the Western, Western limb. And this was sanctioned and allowed by, um, by the state. And the question is, and this is kind of uh, my last set of points here, the question is, why was this allowed? How was this allowed? And I want to just move over to uh, a document that I think is representative of the argument and the pressure that Impala was putting on the South African uh, Department of Minerals and Energy such that they could uh, access and hold on to these rights. And this is what they said in, in this document. If there is to be any growth, um, with all this implies for the economy, the potential for retention or even increase in jobs in this industry, in the platinum or the mining industry, 
In South Africa, it must come from increased competitiveness between MPLATs, that's Impala Platts, and AMPLATs, that's Anglo Platinum. This is only achievable if MPLATs is positioned to challenge the competitive dominance of AMPLATs. So this is one case, and it's one case of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very stark case, but it's one case of, of many at the time, where the state, the South African state, was adjudicating uh, control and access to mineral resources between two major monopolies um, in, in the sector, MPLATs and AMPLATs. And they were and they were very open to to handing uh, over some of the control to implants and using this as the vehicle to undermine um, um, Anglo's control of the area, partially because it demonstrated their commitment to kind of a business community um, and to the investment environment by handing it over to another major company. They were also convinced by the argument that mining is very capital intensive. And so they felt um, assured that Impala Platinum would be able to follow through on their commitment to um, operationalizing the mine, but also following through on their empowerment or uh, commitment or economic growth commitment. And Impala very successfully manages to convince them that it is by adjudicating this competition that uh, the state will be able to drive through their transformation, their agenda of racial transformation. In turn, what they offered then was um, a range of empowerment uh, deals with black actors, but also a series of uh, tenders that would be opened up onto the mine, on the mines, uh, you know, uh, cleaning the mines. Uh, there, there's a range of economic activity that happens beyond just extracting minerals minerals from the ground, and of course, uh, bringing on the tribal authority, the local tribal authority representative. Um, into, into the deal. And so here again is an example where the relationship between the state and business is one that opens up a space for accumulation to happen through exactly this mechanism that I'm trying to outline, uh, this kind of vertical integration upwards. And by demonstrating this, I'm hoping to show that uh, South African society in this period is stratifying in a way that might in some uh, in the minds of some look like kind of neo-patrimonialism or clientelism, but in reality, the state is a key actor in all of this. And this is not simply um, uh, um, a form of society that has been characterized um, elsewhere um, by, by, ra by a range of scholars elsewhere. Um, and this is a very hip-hating and not rise of um, a growing capitalist economy. So let me end there. I hope my time is okay. Uh, yes, it looks like I've um, it's just 30 minutes. Thanks so much, Laura, um, for that really interesting paper. I'll hand over to Tim now um, for his commentary, and then we'll open for discussion. So please start thinking of questions. You can either type them into the chat box um, while Tim is talking, or wait and raise your hand um, once he's finished. Thanks, Tim. Lovely. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Really looking forward to this discussion. Um, Laura, as you know, I'm rubbish at uh, technology. Uh, would you mind at all putting up the uh, that 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 um, uh, your introduction? Because uh, that might just help uh, focus some of my comments. Um, I really enjoyed reading the paper, really enjoyed the discussion. There are all sorts of ways the discussion can go. I thought of two, um, one of them being kind of a history um, approach um, in that these connections between apartheid and the Bantu stands and this post-apartheid predicament, Laura, I think really is doing something quite exciting on the front line of new ways of of, of, of thinking about South Africa's complex history. Um, and maybe one avenue of discussion to go forward would be thinking about the different sorts of politics uh, that there were. I guess what Laura's focused on is the story of NAFCOC, which uh, rooted in, um, in, 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 in Soweto, in Johannesburg, in Pretoria, in the North, um, people like Richard Maponia. Uh, house burnt out by uh, the 1976 June protests, um, making his money, wasn't it, in the Boa Laura on the buses, um, and uh, daubing and and uh, his horse, his racehorses carrying the colours of the ANC. Um, 
epitomizing the complexities that you are alluding to. Um, if we were to go to KwaZulu Natal, uh, we could be thinking about the complex relationship between Mangasutu Butelezi um, in Yanda Business Association and um, English speaking liberal uh, corporate capital, Tongart, Hewlett, and the like. You know, go over to the Trans Sky and um, you have a whole bunch of Pan African Congress um, exiles who come back to make their money fast with Kaiser Matanzima. Uh, in the 1970s. So there's a whole set of complex histories, um, political histories that you were talking about in your paper. Did you mention also in your presentation, you know, Sorote, um, um, the, 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 the son of, the, oh, sorry, the brother of the famous poet. Um, the, 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 this is one way in which um, the, the, the conversation can go. And I do think you do show that complexity uh, that takes us beyond those kinds of struggle histories in which we say that the dreams of the past uh, were sacrificed after 1994. Um, we, we, we get beyond that very um, blunt assessment by, 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 by saying that, as you say, the NC was a broad church. I, however, want to go down a second route, and that's that tension between accumulation and rent seeking which is particularly there, I thought, in the written paper and, and came up particularly at the end of your, um, of your presentation. And uh, this was uh, the, the, the paper that Laura gave me, highlighted up in yellow and, and, and key phrases. And these are like South African keywords, because as we all know, you know, big history of South Africa, if you're a lefty in the 1970s, is one of the minerals energy complex. South Africa, it's brutal history, one founded on the mines, gold mines to start with, we might say platinum mines today. Uh, one in which capitalist accumulation, you know, founded on the cheap uh, migrant labor, that's at the heart of the story. And in a certain sense, apartheid is a story about how a bunch of what we could call today multinational um, companies, Anglo-American, um, become domesticated, become Africanerized. Uh, 40 lost years, I guess I'm thinking about here. Um, you have an injection of Africana capital right into the heart of, the, of, of, of this minerals energy complex. And as part of a developmental strategy pursued by the apartheid state, a brutally racist and equal one, um, a path of accumulation and growth and developments of sorts at the same time. And in many ways, you know, history of South Africa has been one written by the left, has been one that has spoken in these kinds of terms. Class is one aspect. Accumulation is capitalism, is the other core part of it. But what we're seeing now, I think, in South Africa, and again, as following it in your footnotes, is as part of the critique of so-called state capture, is a critique of a rent-seeking state. Very different analytical set of terms. And as you say and footnoted, um, rent-seeking, um, by contrast, focus of political science, not political economy, focused on the shape of the state um, and, and, and focused on uh, the sorts of rents that a state can take. Now, this is a broader literature um, outside of South Africa that uh, develops um, classically Jean-Francois Bayard, uh, 1993, and, and so forth. There's a very sophisticated literature going on on almost like a parallel line to South Africa. South Africa is kind of accumulation, capitalism, class formation. You've, also, you, you've got a, a second, a parallel set of debates north of the Limpopo, we might say, about rent-seeking, patrimonialism, um, clientelism. And one of the res unresolved tensions, I think, not just in your paper, but for the whole of, um, of, 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 of the way we need to think about South Africa's past uh, and present, um, connecting apartheid to post-apartheid, is how do we put these two literatures together? Because yes, there has been this recent dis um, there has been this recent um, discovery by not just South African investigative journalists talking about you know the state capture. There's also now a lot more discussion about rent seeking forms of rent seeking. But how do we link up? that sort of literature to questions of capitalism and accumulation. 
How do they go together? I'm sure this is something that you're thinking about in other parts of your dissertation uh, come book. Uh, you know, uh, th th those are the big questions that tend to get asked in introductions and conclusions. That's not just a question about footnotes. That's not just a question about authors and referencing. That's also a question when we get into the very practical questions of, I'm going to take it in reverse order, platinum and then um, pensions. Starting with platinum. Um, obviously, the minerals energy complex being at the heart of the being at the heart of South Africa's growth trajectory over the you know, past century and a half or so. And then I guess the question that, caught, that, that, that was open-ended for me is, does the post-apartheid state have a strategy of accumulation and growth? Or is it purely one of rent-seeking? I think you show very effectively and very interestingly with very great, you know, historical nuance um, how it makes turns itself into an adjudicator to 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 manage a process of vertical chains and networks of 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 of, of, of rent seeking. Um, in what sense, though, is there a, 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 a strategy of growth? I don't know the story about platinum so much, but I guess the story of gold um, has been something of a disaster after 1994 and mining. You know, mining investment is not going into South Africa. It's going into West Africa. It's going into Australia. Um, this, to me, doesn't look like a post-apartheid state that thinks a huge amount about growth and accumulation. Um, and that's a question to work through, because I guess a state that has not been shot through by societal networks, you know, a la Jean-Francois Bayard, is a state um, that has a, 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 a functioning, um, bureaucratic, insulated from political pressures. This is the, 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 the literature on developmental state. And when you see, I guess, you know, the nightmare of exploration licenses, um, it would seem that, 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 that the state is losing aspects of its capability, um, maybe more in recent years. But the, 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 these are tensions, you know, that, that, that I guess we all are thinking about on a daily basis with uh, every headline that we read. That's then just to avoid running over the... I would raise that question again about um, pensions. One of the things I really enjoyed reading your, um, your, 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 your paper was the story of a number of, as you said, um, businessmen embedded in the Bantu stands who then go through into the post-apartheid period to make their money out of cash paymaster services. But again, a question, accumulation or rent seeking? Um, you had the cane furniture king of um, Laboa. Was it Laboa? Yes, uh, Habakkuk uh, Sikwane. Yeah, I hope I get him right. Fascinating, because as we all know, you know, apartheid, this is a moment when manufacturers um, really take off across country. Manufacturing almost takes over mining as being the leading sector. And I guess there's the clothing sweatshops of Durban, but really interesting to tease out the story of, say, the Kane Furniture King uh, and others also making that money during that time of import substitution industrialization. A question then arises, what happens after 1994 when all those tariff barriers come down? You know, people like Vishnu Padiachi talk about this. When is it still possible to be a Kane Furniture King in South Africa nowadays? Or does all the stuff come from, I don't know, China? Um, and in what case, what happens to um, Habakkuk Sikwane. Can we still think of him as a capitalist or has he turned into- But the state and the department- In forming this, you know, do, do, does that group of um, stakeholders he puts together, uh, do they add value to CPS, to cash paymaster services or not? These are really difficult questions. Uh, ones I guess we all wrestle over nonstop. So uh, I offer no answers and uh, look forward to, to, to discussion. Thank you.
Um, thanks, Tim. Laura, would you like to respond to that first? Sure. Um, thanks so much, Tim. You really kind of hit the nail on the head with the kind of the the issues that I'm trying to work through. So I don't, I really don't have any kind of concrete answers, um, but just to say first that it's incredibly helpful to have you position uh, the story that I'm trying to tell as one is trying to marry and kind of come to some kind of accommodation between a set of literatures um, about, as you say, rent seeking and kind of capitalist accumulation. And I guess part of what I uh, am seeing and trying to describe, but then, you know, really teasing apart in, in the analysis is something that looks so much like rent seeking um, and trying to understand how that can both, how can that, how that can exist alongside with at times a state of developmental agenda. I mean, it's certainly true that, for example, um, parts of uh, the discussion around the MPRDA, and uh, which is really, I think, centered around platinum as kind of the the savior potentially of, uh, of gave them control over these minerals, and if the does have a very developmental agenda in some parts, but then it gets, then it kind of it brings in this question of the chieftaincy, who the chiefs who, who absolutely are rent seekers in the whole story. Um, and I'm not really sure exactly how to marry those two, those two kind of tensions and the pulls against one, one, one another. Um, similarly, you know, yeah, how how should one characterize the introduction of uh, pensions across South African society? Never mind Cash, Serge, Bellamont, and, and the rest of them. The R, the RDP. How should one characterize that? Um, I, I don't know if it can be characterized um, with one set of narrow lenses and then look at exactly how it plays out with a different, a different lens or if there's a way to integrate that a bit better. Um, so thank you so much. That's a really helpful kind of frame, framing for it. And I hope that others um, might be able to contribute to the discussion and Tim and I can keep talking. Thanks, Laura. Um, are there any questions? can use um, the raise hand function. Laszlo? Thank you very much, Laura and uh, Tim, uh, for the presentation and the discussion. I enjoyed it. Uh, my question was, uh, to what extent um, are, these power, are these relationships uh, around, um, uh, what's it? Uh, around tenders, uh, similar to wide relationships during apartheid between business and the state? Are there continuities, similarities, or differences? To, to what is, is this a separate history, uh, or does, is it connected to a, a broader South African history of the relationship between state and business? So, thank you. Should I respond? Yeah, uh, thanks, Lazo. That's also a really great and helpful question because part of what has to be asked is what's new and what's different about about this story. Um, and I can't speak to what's new and what's different um, on a kind of national scale, but I can say speak a little bit about what happens with tendering in um, Lebo in the old Bantustan. Um, and that is a story of a lot of racial dynamics because uh, in many instances, there are white companies who are winning tenders in the Bantustan to provide infrastructure, to build schools, to do, to do that kind of thing. Um, and it is in many ways a story that looks, um, that it has many vertical relations. There are politics at play here that help you win tenders in uh, quite a similar way to the politics that are at play. It's a, different, it's a different group of people that are in power, but it's a similar set of kind of vertical relations that are operating pre-94 in Liboa. And in fact, what is very interesting is that um, some one of the ways in which you can kind of get BE points post-94 in the provinces is uh, by having a black partner. Um, and many white companies who win tenders at the provincial level post-94 had uh, developed black partners uh, through the sim a similar set of policy requirements in the Bantu in Liboa, in the Bantustans. And so they're able to just to move those joint relationships into the post-94 period to benefit from um, BE-style policies. And in both instances, to with variations, the black partners are not productive partners in that relationship. They're securing, they're, they're acting to secure um, the tender. So there is interesting continuities um, 
and I, you know, the the politics changes and the political economy changes in in serious ways. Um, but to pick up on Tim's earlier point about, for example, this one character in uh, the story and the research that I've done, Habakkuk Shekwane, the cane furniture king, and by all accounts, he had the most lovely cane furniture. Um, uh, he and many of his uh, contemporaries in manufacturing move from, as, as Tim put it, from being kind of capitalists who are involved in manufacturing to using the profits from that period to kind of um, drive their involvement in a, in a more financialized kind of economy post-94 because manufacturing, amongst other sectors of the economy, manufacturing collapses so, so dramatically. NAFCOC makes a real play. They really try to kind of develop support for that elite level of the old manufacturing company, but they're up against enormous structural forces that they can't win, and they can't win the battle at all. And so manufacturing collapses. Um, but manufacturing wasn't the only way in which people made their money uh, in business pre-94. Um, some of it was, re a lot of it was retail. Um, and uh, interestingly, a lot of it are, is constructed uh, which was construction, some of them really starting as like small time uh, builders who then uh, managed to work their way into major construction companies or major construction firms. And there's a huge demand for them post-94 for the rollout of RDP kind of policies. Yeah. And just to jump in and just to say if one was to get beyond, because it's very easy to tell a story of tenders, tenders, corruption, corruption and retail and commerce, you know, huge growth sector, and all those continuities, you, 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 you see them um, in so many provinces, don't you? These kinds of apartheid era, um, small business retailers, some of whom make the jump, others of whom get swallowed by Boxer Superstore. But if you can survive Boxer, it, I, th I think that is the fascinating, most dynamic sector of the economy in a certain sense. Yeah, sorry. No, go ahead, Laura. It's a particularly nice example of that with um, uh, with uh, property that is ends up where a particular where a company Moolmans um, makes huge money pre ninety four through their relationship with the Liberal government. Um, and then post-94, they provide, they're not the construction, but they do all the real estate around supermarkets and huge supermarkets across the country. Yeah. Um, I don't see any hands up at the moment, but I just wanted to ask a little bit about the research process um, of doing this kind of work. And I know before we started, you were talking about the Labor Archives and the state of the archives. But I'm wondering, in particular, with this project, um, what was the research process like? Did you find that people were willing to talk to you about this, or are you mainly working with the court documents that you referred to? Um, what has that been like working on something that's incredibly contemporary, and how has your historian's mind been, been exercised um, by working on these contemporary issues? Yeah. Um I'm sure Tim will also have things to say because he also works on a relatively contemporary period. Um, but um, I have found that, uh, so so some of the kinds of um, documentary evidence I've used is, as I said, a lot of court documents, um, private archives, which people have at times opened up to me, NAFCOC publications, which are public, but then interviews. But interviews are difficult because I'm not an investigative journalist. And I don't want to be in it. Well, I mean, I wouldn't mind being an investigative journalist, but that's not what I am. Um, and uh, it's quite hard to get to the structures behind something when something uh, around a particular issue, when it is a huge scandal and people want to kind of just discuss the scandal parts of it or deny their involvement in something. And so interviews haven't functioned in the way in which sometimes interviews in other parts of my research have, where with all the caveats that one takes, um, you, you try to get some information from the interviews. You, you know, you count for memory and everything else, but you try to get some information. And it hasn't been useful really to approach interview material like that for this more, more contemporary research. And it's perhaps been more the... 
uh, skills of an anthropologist. Not that I've done kind of full on ethnographic research, but I find that the kind of information that I want and the texture to the dynamics and the relationships are, um, I get them more by just kind of hanging or pre COVID when I was doing the research, spending a lot of time with people going around with them and trying to see some of the informal relationships uh, that they have with other groups of people that aren't kind of always stated and aren't always spoken about it very, very explicitly. Um, and that is kind of, so, I mean, so Tim saw what is a very, very early draft of how I'm thinking about this. And Tim, you would have seen that there were very few references to interviews with people. And when they were there, I was really just trying to say, so-and-so told me this piece of information and that's how I'm using that. But they, I did have a lot of conversations with people, but mostly to try and kind of piece together a much more subtle context um, so I could paint the structure rather than uh, just secure facts from them. The Leboa archives, uh, you know, do have a little bit of material post-94, but that is very hit and miss. Uh, you never know whether you're going to get them or not. And in fact, I haven't been to them since COVID, so I don't know what state they are in now. I don't know if anybody else um, has been to to the provincial or, or local archives since COVID. But yeah, it's it's a tough it's tough to work in them, particularly for the contemporary period, because you actually aren't supposed to see a lot of that contemporary material. So it's just kind of squeezed into into a box unexpectedly. Yeah. Is there also a, a, an added story here? The basically the archives of the state aren't in triplicate, and you know that kind of modernist, all-seeing state that was kind of 1960, and particularly after 1994, with the rise of consultancies. Uh, and the rise of so much thinking being out outsourced to consultants. Um, I think people who do contemporary history, one of the big adventures is trying to think creatively about how to get hold of documents. And I think we're going to have to think a lot about who holds knowledge and power. And that probably means not going to the National Archives in the same way that American historians do, because they don't know how to do anything else. Sorry. <laughs> um, Laszlo, you've got your hand up for last question. Yeah, if nobody else is going to ask. I was wondering, uh, do you, Laura, do you perhaps have any examples how businessmen themselves describe these relationships? Because you make use of those, uh, you, make, you make reference to those theories uh, about describing these relationships, but how, how do people themselves, uh, if, if you do have, describe uh, the reasons for these rela uh, these relations, uh, or and, and, and what words did they use, what vocabulary did they use to describe it? How do they, they themselves see these systems? Yeah, one of the um, very interesting dynamics. So this the kind of time period of the research is um, up until the early two thousands. And there was a major change in the networks in power in Limpopo after 2009, um, when uh, Zuma came to power and then Malema came uh, to power as well. And Malema managed to dominate Limpopo politics in a kind of a new, a newish, a newish way. And so, most often, when I was interviewing people and speaking to them, they would contrast their experiences. Um, and the work that they did with uh, a newer, younger, in their words, brasher, more masculine, more aggressive crowd of tender, in, tenderpreneurs, which is never a word that they would use to describe themselves. That's a post-2009 phenomenon in Mpopo, if you listen to this kind of category and group of business businessmen. Um, and so to the degree that people are explaining and characterizing their informal networks that they're operating in. It's, as you would expect, it's never kind of explained in ways that are sinister or um, under the table at all, but rather um, as, as a set of relationships uh, forged in a difficult period pre-94 when, um, despite the fact that, uh, you know, much of Le Bois was an incredibly, uh, much of the, many of the residents in Le Bois were incredibly poor and impoverished. 
um, and the elite business people were not, they still had a difficult time. They were working under difficult conditions. Um, and so those relationships are often thought about or spoken to me about as bonds of solidarity rather um, and, and compared and contrasted to bonds of solidarity and commitment compared to kind of a newer, younger generation of EFF-driven uh, tender, tender entrepreneurs. Yeah. And it's by picking apart exactly, you know, what this bond of solidarity is that you start to see who, which actor is where. Yeah. Thank you. That was nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, um, unless there are any other hands up, which I don't see, that's all. Tim, <laughs> Tim, would you like to have the last, last word here? Sorry, no, you should have it. I just wanted to say, I mean, look, we all know this, but let, 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 let's just put it out there. You know, President Cyril Ramaphosa is really Miss, Mr. Masterpe. You know, he's married into, it's this incredible, tiny um, business elite really powerful. And if this was America, you know, people write oodles of books on the Rockefellers. Um, and so Laura's just like stepping into something really, really big. And we really need to get beyond the kind of gotcha daily maverick scandal headlines to understand what's going on. And you only do that through empathy and history. Um, so that's why I enjoyed reading it. Thanks, Tim. Thank you so much um, to Tim and to Laura for this really interesting paper. And it's really exciting to see how your skills as a historian um, can add so much nuance to the story that we all know snippets about, but nothing near this level of detail, um, which we really need as a country. So it feels very exciting um, to hear about your work. And we're looking forward to the book project when it comes out. Good luck. Um, I hope your marking doesn't eat too much into the book writing time. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to everyone for joining us. And see you next time. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Thank you, colleagues.